Well, hi everybody, Father Alex here. Welcome to another episode of the Godcast. Uh, I'm the vicar of St Matthew's Church. I'm also uh, a member of the Church of England General Synod. I'm the author of Our Daily Bread uh, from August to the Altar, which is available in all good bookshops. And I'm the host of the Godcast. Thank you for joining me. If you do enjoy today's uh, interview, then please do follow me on Twitter. You'll find me there on X at Alex DJ Frost, or perhaps subscribe to the YouTube channel. My guest today on the Godcast is Zach Polanski. Zach is the deputy leader of the Green Party in England and Wales, and he's also a member of the London Assembly. So I do very much hope you enjoy this interview now with Zach Polanski. Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast this week is uh, Zach Polanski, who's uh, deputy leader of the Green Party in England and Wales. And uh, Zach, it's fabulous to meet you and get you on. How are you? I'm I'm great. It's wonderful to be on. Thank you very much for for providing the platform and and for what you're doing with the with the webcast. Thank you. Thanks, um, Zach. Um, uh, in recent days in the church, uh, the news has broken about uh, Justin Welby stepping down. Um, you know, maybe as a person of faith, but maybe as a as a man in the political environment. What what's your reaction and thoughts about what's been uh, uncovered in recent days? I mean, it's intensely grim. I was on Newsnight as the story was breaking and uh, there was a survivor who was giving uh, their testimony and just to be in the room and, and hear what was being said is something that, that, that will stay with me. I think ultimately, you know, this has to be a matter for the church to resolve, but also the church has to be scrutinised and so should be rightly held to account. Um, I obviously think that Justin Welby stepping down was the right thing to do. His position was clearly untenable. Um, I think it speaks to a much bigger issue in society, which is around power um, and the unbalance of power and powerful people that people are, are scared to challenge. And that happens both within the church uh, and other religions, too, I'm sure, throughout our political system and indeed in business. And I think it speaks to why we need to make sure there are mechanisms in place where people are able to speak out, are able to be believed um, or a presumption to be able to be believed and, and then investigated. And that um, we're always striving to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable and the institutions we're within accountable, because as this shows, uh, I was about to say no one's perfect, and but perfect is an understatement here. This was clearly a huge failing, and uh, I hope that learnings need to urgently be had. Yeah, I'm very grateful for you actually saying that, Zach, because, you know, I'm obviously part of the Church of England, feeling rather bruised and battered, um, and of course prioritising the those who've been abused at the absolute forefront of this. I, you know, I can't help find myself trying to be a little bit defensive of the church because, you know, being in the system, I recognise it does an awful lot of good stuff as well. And, and um, you know, there are many institutions who probably have to, have to like, you, like you've just said, you know, hold the mirror up to themselves and, and hold themselves accountable. Yeah, I think you're, you're entirely right. And I think that is also a fair point that, a lot of these institutions are providing uh, solace for people. They're providing community um, solidarity. And that's why it makes it even more egregious when they let people down so badly. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the things I heard was was the survivor say, you know, ultimately he was accused uh, by John Smythe of being the sinner. Well, you know, could you be more of a sinner than someone who's committing these things? Now, it's not for us to, to cast that judgment on people. Um, but you can certainly have a strong opinion. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that, Zach. Now, now, people who are familiar with the Godcast, we don't just do uh, hardline politics. We we try and find out a bit about the the person as well. Uh, Zach, tell tell us a bit for people who aren't familiar. Tell us a bit about your your upbringing, for example. Where did where did you grow up, and what was your education like? Yeah, so I'm glad you ask it like this because I'm an unlikely politician. I've been through lots of routes and, and lots of different jobs. And I think that's really healthy. I think far too often in politics, we see people who knew from age 14, 15, they wanted to be a politician. And they they ticked all the right boxes. But I was born um, in Manchester. Um, my kind of growing up was quite lonely, to be honest, I think largely because of being uh, gay and, and not knowing that there was an LGBT community at that time. Um, my parents were going through what I would describe as a pretty messy divorce. Um, and so I, I grew up in a in a space that felt like it was very um, just quite chaotic and, and not particularly stable. Now, that isn't a woe is me story. I know people who live up in you know much more chaotic environments and say, you know, I'm, I'm aware of my privilege in that sense. Um, but but school just never connected with me at all. And it's interesting because um, I absolutely love to learn. It's one of the 
the biggest things I find joy from is is reading about things I don't know about or, you know, even as simple as I do Duolingo every single day. I can't let that streak go. But at school, I absolutely hated learning languages. And I sometimes think if you wanted to create a system that would prevent someone from learning or prevent someone from being their best self or being uh, contributing to the community, you might design the school system as it is now because sometimes I think that creates so many barriers for anyone who doesn't fit an exact mold. That's not, you know, slating all schools. There's, there's some brilliant teachers out there and there's some brilliant schools out there, but certainly the education I had, I would say I, I really didn't enjoy. My little brother and sister who were quite quite young, uh, quite a lot younger than me, they're twins, they went through a home education um, a period or phase and I saw, I saw the benefits of, of what they got from that. Uh, and they weren't alone. There was a whole group of them who were all home educating uh, each other. Now, it's not to say that's always the way it should be. And this is an anti-school message. It's not that at all. But I just think uh, there's got to be different ways that, that work for, for different children. And my way certainly didn't work for me as I was growing up. Having said that, you know, I, I am the person who I am now, partly through those experiences and partly through that resilience. I guess there's a long way of saying I was quite badly bullied at school. Yeah. Well, um, well, I was, I was as well, Zach, and 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 your story, although I, although I'm not gay, is very similar to yours. You know, I hated school, and and even in the church, you know, I'm fighting uh, uh, for a private member's motion uh, for for people from working classes who, who who perhaps are similar to you and I, who who just feel that academia is not who love learning, but maybe uh, there is a different way to do it. So I'm really grateful. And what about what about faith, Zach? Was that was that part of your young life? Just just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, it was very part, uh, much part of my young life. I went to a Jewish school, um, and even on the weekends, I go to something called Cheda, which is um, essentially extra Jewish education um, around the Torah and the scriptures, and guests would come in. Um, interestingly, when I was, well, so then I had a, a bar mitzvah, and this is a very kind of typical uh, modern Jewish story, which is after my bar mitzvah, I then didn't go to synagogue for a long time. It's kind of, I'd done that bit, I'd become a man. And um, uh, again, it, it kind of clashed around my, my parents' divorce time too. So I think complications at home just meant that completely dropped off. Um, interestingly, I, when I went to my secondary school, uh, there was no kind of uh, Jewish aspect to the school assembly. And I'd feel deeply uncomfortable uh, praying or, 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 or in that kind of, maybe deeply uncomfortable is too strong, but it just wouldn't feel like my place. I'd come from a Jewish school and suddenly there was this whole language I didn't understand. So one of our the school teachers used to take the eight of us who were Jewish at my school to a separate room where each day one of us would have to prepare a debate um, and then we would debate an issue of the day uh, and then talk about how that related to either our connection to God or community. And I think uh, I just think that was absolutely beautiful. One, there's an old kind of Jewish tradition or meme about having you know five Jewish people and six different opinions. So that was very much in line with with my education anyway and, and the, the community I come from. But two, I think that must have, when I when I backtrack now or, or look back now, must contribute to the person I am today and the, the things I enjoy doing, that kind of love of debating. Um, years went by where I didn't engage with faith at all um, or with particularly with the Jewish community. Um, and then I became vegan uh, much later in life. And from being vegan and, and kind of really caring about animal rights, I then came across the environmental movement, which obviously very heavily links with with uh, the green movement and the climate crisis. Um, but also at that time, it was in that green movement that I bumped back into my Jewish faith because there are lots of not just Jewish people, but people from all sorts of faiths who are on the front line uh, tackling the climate crisis, who are making the links between caring for the planet. Yes, uh, very important but also while we're caring for the planet, caring for each other as well and compassion and solidarity towards human beings that are the same as you and human beings that are totally different from you and finding that empathy um, and love throughout everything you do. And so uh, am I a faith? Uh, probably not. Um, I don't, I'm not in a kind of any formal sense. Um, do I espouse to the central values that I see of faith of being about compassion, solidarity, humanity, absolutely those run through, well, I hope they run through absolutely everything I do. And in those times that they don't, I try and check myself, take a deep breath and always come back to compassion and love because I think that's the only places where any progress can ever come from. So um, complicated question around faith. Um, I think the answer is no, I wouldn't consider myself a man of faith, but it certainly runs, the, the pillars of it run through everything I do. It, it's uh, it's interesting listening to that, Zach. I've, I've, 
what you said reminds me of an interview I did with Eamon Holmes, who was brought up a Roman Catholic, and who who um, he said something like, "You can you can uh, you can take the Catholic out of the person, but you can't take the person out of the Catholic." And and maybe there's a little bit in that in your in your your own uh, story. Um, well, but, it's, um, uh, can, can I just because it's got more complicated recently too, and I, I know we're not doing too heavy politics, but if you'll forgive me for forty five oh, seconds, say. Um, my Jewish identity has always been something that's been important to me, but I would say not central. Um, and I think too often in British political discourse, a Jewish identity has been conflated with an Israeli identity. And uh, it's something I've always found uncomfortable um, and something in the past, if someone had asked me, I would say is uncomfortable, but I wouldn't necessarily speak heavily on because I just think it's not my space to, to be this voice of the Jewish community. But I think since October 7th and, and the horrific attacks, but then the massively disproportionate genocide um, in Gaza and what's happening in Lebanon and, and around the whole region, I found it increasingly important as a Jewish person who's critical of the Israeli government to consistently speak out about the differences and actually say, that's not me speaking for the entire Jewish community. No one can do that, but no one else should be claiming to do that either. And so I found my Jewish identity almost becoming even more of my identity now because what's happening in Israel uh, does not correlate to anything I understand as Jewish identity or anything I identify as a religious identity. And so in some ways, it's made me stronger in my Jewish identity because I think, how dare you? How dare you take that from me and, and from people who care about peace and compassion and solidarity and love and international justice? And so, yeah, it's interesting that that's almost been pushed to the forefront now and, and has felt increasingly important. I think that's fascinating to hear you say that, Zach. I've, I've been blessed to go to the, the Holy Land a few times and... Uh, and see a really diverse community of uh, Jewish people, uh, you know, not just very traditional Orthodox individuals, but, you know, uh, you know, and I think you don't, we're not hearing that really, are we, in the narrative at the moment? It is kind of very different. Um, yeah, we'll perhaps come back to that, Zach. I, I, if, you, if it's all right, I just want to stick with you a little bit longer. I was interested to know, are you, are you said by your bar mitzvah, you'd, uh, you'd kind of give up the faith for a little bit. Did you know you were gay by the time you'd reached your bar mitzvah, or did that come later in life? No, I think I think I did know, and I um, it felt uncomfortable um, with with some of the the teachings. I, it was you know a liberal Jewish household or a liberal Jewish community, so it wasn't you know that I was being told I was going to be cast down in sin. But I just never saw someone who loved in the way that I do represented in the stories or in the. Um, yeah, in the stories, essentially, and stories are so powerful. Yeah, and we yeah. see that throughout religion. And I think they can be a force for good and they can be a force for bad. And it's partly, again, I've come back to politics again. I'll, I'll quickly get off and again in a second. But um, actually, it's not politics. It's everything. The stories that are told are so important, as are the storytellers. And you mentioned about class before. Um, I Before I was in a, a politician, I'm sure we'll get onto this, I was a former theatre actor. And so the stories that are told through theatre, film and TV are so important in kind of navigating our political uh, discourse, but also more importantly, our communitarian discourse, the stories about who we are, where we've been and where we're going. And faith has a huge role to play in this. But I think so does Coronation Street and EastEnders and the things that beamed into to, into people's households every, every single day. And it's one time or, or, or several times I, I visited Burnley actually um, last year and um, I read that that brilliant book on, on Burnley Road, um, which talks powerfully about um, Burnley's history. And from speaking to people in Burnley, I know lots of people agree with lots that's in the book and people disagree with lots that's in the book. And I think it's brilliant that kind of conversations happened. But I think what's interesting is when you think about places like Burnley uh, or places in the north generally on the national stage, there's uh, very often very narrow stories that are told about them. But actually, when you go visit, you see these incredibly diverse communities with lots of different stories. And I think these stories just aren't being told and working class stories are very often not being told. And I think that relates to who is given the privilege of being able to go to drama school or writing school or have yeah. the time to write. And then um, we've got to broaden these opportunities for people. Otherwise, we'll just hear, hear these narrow stories. Well, uh, you forgive me, Zach. I must promote my book because that's a Burnley story. I've read exactly. and, and I must get you a copy because it, it, it talks about some of the things that you said, you know, that sometimes uh, these uh, these urban settings have got very narrow-minded kind of um, understandings of what they really are and there's a lot more to them. I, I really wouldn't want to be anywhere other than Burnley at this moment in time, if I'm being honest. So, well, I think it's, yeah, so, so we as we move on, you so when when did you kind of 
Can you remember the first time you told somebody that you were gay? Uh, yes, I think I was about 15 years old um, and told one of my best friends. Um, and I think I, uh, it was just an outpouring of crying and tears and just such a relief to, to finally do it. Um, and I think I, actually the, the more important bit is I found the coach to tell her because I went to, I, I grew up in Manchester, as I said, went to Manchester Youth Theatre, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. And Manchester Youth Theatre, as I understand, it was very much about broadening opportunities for, for young people um, and giving people a platform to find the courage to speak. Um, and that, that idea of courage to speak runs throughout my work now, but also from when I was an actor too. Um, particularly, but not always in, in young women, society uh, tells them that they, they shouldn't be speaking or they don't have an important voice to have. And this also and or people from ethnic minority backgrounds. And Manchester Youth Theatre was really good at finding a real diverse uh, range of people, putting us all in um, a residence for, I think it was for six weeks. And you would devise a play together based on based on your stories. And I just remember that six months being uh, six months, six weeks being so transformational in my life to the point of I remember going off a nervous kind of very early teenager at 13 and coming back and my dad just looking at me for a moment and just noting that there was something different about me. And I remember at the time just thinking that he's just being weird. But I think what he probably saw is is that posture change, mm. that being more confident and finishing yeah. your sentence, that sense of who you are. And I wouldn't say it was complete at, at 13, but I think uh, that that six week period probably transformed me more more than any other. So you, you, you enter the world of entertainment. With... Yes, although interestingly, uh, even back then, I became very interested in political theatre and I wouldn't have even classed it as them, but stories about inequality. Mm -hmm. And so I was working with a, a, a theatre group that worked on something called Theatre of the Oppressed. Now, this came out in the 1970s by Augusto Boal in the favelas, the poorest areas in Brazil where they would find communities who felt that there was deep inequality uh, or there was deep inequality, either from politicians, landlords, the police, whoever it might be, uh, people who are abusing power. And what they would do is work with those oppressed people. I'm only putting it in inverted commas because it could be lots of different groups of people um, and helping them to find their voice and helping them to ch challenge power through drama and through acting. They called it rehearsing the revolution. Um, and I became very interested in that throughout my teenage years, and that followed on through my work, which eventually became immersive theatre, um, often looking at political situations. So how do you throw an audience member into a situation where they have to make an ethical or moral choice based on a set of circumstances? And although it's only just play and it's pretend, people having to step into the shoes of another uh, through empathy. And so, yes, it was a lot of fun, but also I think even then it was dealing with some some quite serious issues. Having said that, I was also, you know, in Wizard of Oz and <laughs> some things which I think actually you know, they have some deeply ethical choices too. But we 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 also know what 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 the storyline is before it starts. It's so interesting. We've just uh, recently we had um, uh, the Red Ladder Theatre Group, who are based in in Leeds and is run or partly run by a guy called Boff Wally, who was in uh, Chumbawamba. You remember. I get knocked down and I get up again, and he he he's uh, you know he's very much on the left of politics, and he wrote a, a play, a stroke musical called Sanctuary, which was about an, an Iranian taking sanctuary in a church. Um, it was a bit of a hard sell, but actually we did sell, and it was wonderful to hear people respond and engage. But it was just after the riots as well, so it came perfectly timed. And um, yeah, I think I think there is an. You know, it's probably not going to get uh, Saturday night, eight o'clock viewing on BBC One, but but there is a place for it, isn't there? Well, and I think the other also important thing that massively relates to the moment we're in now is, uh, you know, you said left of politics, and I'd certainly put myself there too. But this work was also about empathising with the oppressed, but also putting yourself into the shoes of the oppressor and always coming from the point of view that this was either a logical choice that was because they were lacking something or they were trying to achieve something or was an emotional choice based on fear and was there a way to help them meet their needs that meant that they wouldn't have to act in a fearful way at all now i think this probably intersects a lot with religion in terms of uh conversations around soul and um even natural justice and, and where people come from and the concept of sin. But I also think massively needs to relate to our politics too, that if we're going to get out of a scenario where we just shout at each other and assume that everyone is unethical, immoral or evil all the time, then we're never going to be able to bridge divides and we're never going to be able to move towards um, uh, consensus or moving way 
and moving things forward. Now, please don't misinterpret that as I'm sure you wouldn't have. I think there have to be red lines and even broad churches have to have walls. But also at the same time, I think we always need to be looking at a way of how do we speak to people who don't necessarily agree with us? And how do we find ways of having complicated and difficult situations that hold honor and dignity to the person that you're disagreeing with? Yeah, I think I think these are the really big questions we need to have. And as uh, thus we fail to have them, I, you know, I'd, uh, I, 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 I've done loads of interviews. If anybody's interested in this kind of discussion, uh, Alex Phillips from Talk Radio uh, talk, speaks very well about this in an interview on the Godcast. So do check that out. But, but you know, in my context, uh, Zach, I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Maybe we can bring in Donald Trump's recent election. Here is that you know I, I work in a very working class, uh, deprived area of high poverty, and um, the people that I'm uh, a parish priest to may be described by some people as as the far right, and and I'm really uncomfortable with the the use of this word far right. Um, but but I think I I recognise in these people, uh, we've been talking a lot about social justice or social injustice. I I, I work with a lot of people who feel they're being let down, you know, and, and by a lot of people. So whether that is uh, the police because of a crime, whether it's the NHS because of a long waiting list, whether it's a housing group because their their kitchen's flooded, whatever it is. These people feel like the, the the back of the queue, and so it's. I think it's reasonably easy for them to listen to, maybe a more uh, destructive narrative, and actually buy into it. And I think if we if we just kind of um, compartmentalize them as as far right, I think we're we. You know, I, I worry, and I've said this in other recent interviews with politicians, Zach, is I worry that Nigel Farage could be the next prime minister. Yeah, I, I think you're entirely right. Um, and I agree with much of what you said there. People are being let down without a doubt. There is mass inequality in our society. People are being told there's no money left while they're seeing people get in private jets. People are told that things are getting better or our economy you know, is heading towards growth whilst they're struggling to pay the rent or even put, put food on the table. I think we saw this during Brexit um, where uh, David Cameron ran a campaign to say if you want everything to stay the same if you're um if you if you don't want to disrupt the status quo then it's really important we remain in the european union and people very understandably when i don't want things to stay the same i'm you know there's, there's a mental health crisis in my society it feels like people don't care and it feels like things are out of control because i'm seeing the other enter my community when there isn't even enough to go around for for our group now I can look that person in the eye and have a, a really important, compassionate conversation about how these issues are not the issues of migrants. These issues are decades of underinvestment, both from a Conservative government, but frankly, a Labour government too, and also under the first past the post system. If people reject the Conservatives, as I think they frequently have, but then look to a Labour government and go, well, you're meant to be the good guys. You're meant to be the ones that care about the working people and care about our communities, but are let down once again then it's not a surprise to me that people uh, in America, for instance, turn to Donald Trump, as Bernie Sanders just very presciently said. I guess it's not prescient because it happened after the event. But he said, if you abandon the working class, the working class will abandon you. And I think that's absolutely true in the UK, too. So I think the conditions right now have never been stronger for a Nigel Farage premiership. Or, you know, it doesn't even have to be as dramatic as that, just as we're already seeing a reform vote to surge. Now, I do think it's important we never call these people who are voting um, for reform the far right. And I think an example of that is people were voting the British, British National Party in Burnley and then just a little time later were voting for the Green Party in the exact same ward where Green councillors were first elected. Do I think people went from the far right to the Green Party in one shift? No, I don't. I think people were disillusioned, disenfranchised, and uh, the British National Party or reform in this case turned up and said, we are listening. And that was enough for people to, to give them their vote. And then they were they were swiftly disappointed. We have to make sure that alternatives are created that involve communities and involve people in that. So people never feel like things are being done to them, but they feel like they're involved in politics and they have a stake in politics. Now, where I differ slightly, although I don't think we necessarily differ on this, while I don't think we should call the voters far right, I do think it's important to talk in legitimate terms about who Donald Trump is or who Nigel Farage is. And if we go to Trump, I think it is important that he's a misogynist. He's someone who's made racist comments. He's someone who has uh, uh, denied climate change. And I think it is important to label these things what they are, because I think if you're peace too long, it shifts the, the window of what is acceptable conversation. 
If we're talking about the voter, though, I think blaming the voter, whether it's ethical or not, uh, that's a different question. I just don't think it's helpful that just uh, telling someone they're wrong and labeling them just pushes them further away. And I think if you give up on people, then they understand that we give up on you. And I think it's really important we have that compassionate space. And more than anything, I think it's important that politicians like myself uh, don't turn up in communities of, like Burnley or wherever it might be and think we have the answers or think we know the communities. To be in listening mode is more important than anything. Uh, and I think it's more important than ever before to hear people's fears, to hear people's worries and to deeply empathise on them before coming up with solutions. But you've got to come from a place of connection first. Otherwise, it, it's, it doesn't just feel out of touch. It is out of touch. Yeah, and 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 what's the what's the strategy then, Zach, for the Green Party as we we come out of a general election? You know, I, I, I'll just be honest. I'm I'm usually quite honest. Yeah, I sometimes wonder if the Green Party is a sticking is 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 actually a difficulty for you because you will always get people who will go, yeah, that that represents me because it's about the environment. But but maybe it actually uh, turns some people away from 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 the party because they think that's all you're about. So. So what is the kind of ambition and the, and the project ahead for you in the coming years, Zach? Yeah, I think this is a vital question. And one thing that I've been on a mission ever since I was elected as deputy leader to talk about is how there's no environmental justice without racial, social and economic justice too. So if I break that down in 30 seconds, if we look on the international level, you can talk about the climate crisis and, you know, we've seen the floods in Valencia. But actually, when we do a heavy focus on Valencia, it's missing the fact that there's been, and Valencia is awful, I'm not saying for a second it isn't, but there's been huge droughts across South America for a long time. We've got huge heat waves um, in West Africa. And we need to recognize historically that a lot of the emissions that have, have been given are because of exploitation, colonialization, empire. So I think we need to have really honest conversations in this country around reparations about racial injustice. And that's on a global level. But if we're going to get much more local, that happens on the local level too. When you look at places like Burnley or some of our poorer cities or towns around the around the country, that's frequently where the air pollution is worst. And that's because roads are built there, public uh, transport, the infrastructure isn't invested in, um, and incinerators and things like that that are terrible for the air are also, are also built there. And they don't care about the community because they assume, well, they'll vote Labour anyway. Well, we'll always get those votes. We don't need to worry about them. So this mass injustice and inequality is baked throughout everything in society. And as a Green Party, it's been really important for us that we're seen to be campaigning and making change on things like homelessness, on protecting our national health service and making sure that's fully accessible to all. Talking about uh, adult social care, which too frequently is the poorer cousin to the national health service, but actually social care is a ticking time bomb. Lots of people have caring responsibilities that's not being um, dealt with in the economy or seen as an important role in the economy. And that frequently falls onto women and far too often on uh, working class women and women of colour. So I, I think there's all of these issues. Also, I've spoken about Gaza already and around international justice. I think we just need to make sure that the Green Party increasingly have urgent, necessary and right things to say on all of these issues. Um, I think I'm not making excuses, but this has been a huge issue of the media in the past kind of few decades that if there's any story that isn't about the climate crisis, they don't come to the Green Party. And then it's the climate crisis, they only come to the Green Party and they don't let you speak about anything else. I think that's shifting, though, because we're learning that even when we talk about the climate crisis, we always talk about it, that, you know, this is an issue of inequality. The richest 1% around the world are burning more emissions than the lowest two thirds of humanity. And when you look finally at people's homes, the homes where people's bills are the highest are the poorest insulated homes, which means that your bills are high, we're emitting emissions, and we could create jobs by making sure we're insulating people's homes, which keeps people warmer and reduces bills. And we've got to keep joining all these dots. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff, Zach, you know, because again, you know, I'm I'm fiercely proud of my town and fiercely want to stand up. And I try and th I think I speak quite uh, with, uh, you know, good knowledge about the town setting. And I think if you ask people in my context about environmental green issues, they they would say, well, there's they'd want to speak about, you know, the I, I think the uh, environment of, a, of an estate, for example, sets the tone for uh, how it might actually be. You know, I think you can tell a lot by the state of an estate. So we see horrendous issues with fly tipping, uh, you know, 23 tonnes of uh, uh, rubbish was lifted off our estates recently, and we walk. Uh, we have a beautiful. We're right by the Leeds Liverpool Canal. It's full of uh, supermarket trolleys and 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 rubbish, 
Um, and and I, I I think uh, these people are see you know the the potholes and all this and 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 the rivers are in a bit of a state. I think these are the things that that matter locally in a town like Burnley. Is is that fair? Do you think? I think that's totally fair. People care about their their daily experience. And I think, you know, when you talk about estates, I come straight back to community centres too that, that are frequently shut down. Trees that could be around the estate that make things more pleasant. That's good for the environment, but it's also good. There's lots of uh, statistics to show how that reduces crime rates as well because people take more care about the area they live in. And I think it's exactly that. It's a hyper-localised community politics. Uh, there's that thing of uh, think local and act global, but actually I would say act local and act global. Both of these things really matter. But I think the broad point of your question is absolutely true that people often think the green movement of the environmental movement they think of cop and those world issues and those things are important but actually people's daily experience of having a, a clean space to to live in which is good for our mental health where everything works um that is clean and tidy that it's not fly tipped and if it is fly tipped the the perpetrators are held responsible all of those things are, are, are really important and then my second thing too about the polluter pays so there's this idea that if well we do need to transition, we need to make sure that we're, we're changing our behaviours. But people who have been hit by a cost of living crisis, largely driven by fossil fuels, are going, I'm already struggling. And now you're asking me to pay more to change my boiler or to get on public transport. Whereas actually the government should be making sure that the cheapest option is also the greenest option. And the way to fund that largely is by making sure that the fossil fuel companies who have been making record profits fuel that money from their profits back into our public sector and our public services alongside public sector funding. And so when you put all of those things together, will people need to transform their behavior? Yes, absolutely. And I think we need to be honest about that. Will people need to make sacrifices? No, not necessarily. This is all about actually making a better community and a better society that also happens to be a greener one. Yeah, it's fascinating what you say there. I mean, I just, uh, so, so our church, we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, uh, spiritually rich but a financially poor church and we had the misfortune of our boiler packing up and uh, everybody wanted us to go carbon net zero, Zach. Um, but the reality was is the boiler we actually went for was £28,000, which is a lot of money for an urban church. Uh, and the, the the cheapest quote we could get to be greener was £100,000. Um, and that was even with, with potential grants and things like that. So you know, people do need to make things cheaper, but it's not currently happening, is it? Yeah, it's absolutely outrageous. And during the general election, uh, Carla Daniel, who's the co-leader of the Green Party, now Bristol's MP, uh, she was uh, attacked by the media because she admitted in inverted commas that she still had a gas boiler and wanted to change it to a heat pump. And she couldn't afford to do it because she didn't have a job role at that time that meant she could afford to do it. Now she's an MP. I'm pleased to say she's in the um, she's transitioning over now. But unless people have that financial capital or have you know that space to do it, then they absolutely can't do it. And so the fossil fuel companies were very clever in the 1970s. They came up with this idea of a carbon footprint. So they talked about people having to individually change the amount of emissions. You know, this is the talk of recycling or heat pumps or uh, electric cars. That is a complete distraction from actually what needs to happen, which is the big system change, which is businesses, corporations and governments making those huge changes and making it cheaper for the individual person, you or I or someone watching or listening this, to be able to make the change that, that we need for the planet because it's the cheapest and easiest change to make. All of those possibilities are absolutely out there. They are a result of political choices at the moment, which means they're trying to push that onto the consumer, which, of course, will always have backlash against the green movement more widely, because why should an individual have to sacrifice or pay more that they already can't afford to, to do the right thing? That has to be the role of government and has to be the role of uh, businesses who are polluting our planet to make sure that they're affording us to make that transition. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I mean, I, I talked to you for ages, like, but I, might, I like to keep my podcast quite tight. But but the, um, what do you think the role media's got to play this? I mean, I've just we've just had a 30-minute conversation where... Uh, you know, whether it's hundreds or thousands who listen to this interview, there's an opportunity to hear you speak um, without kind of a, a two minute timer of your shoulder, you know, and the media really likes to kind of set people up, don't they? You know, you're in one camp and somebody who holds a different view. Do, do you think they've got a responsibility to actually do some what I would describe as proper journalism and, and proper investigation in these matters? 
And more than a responsibility, I think of all the things that I feel strongest about, this, this is one of them actually, along with the climate crisis, that I think the media are so responsible for so much of a division and uh, lack of progress that we have in our political system. Now, it's not just the media, the, the politicians who operate in that system and audit the media and have chosen not to regulate the media are ultimately responsible for that and they've created the conditions for that to happen. But I think undoubtedly we have a media that aren't asking the right questions. I think, again, I come back to the genocide uh, that we've seen in Gaza. You know, we had a media who was so hostile to the idea, that, you know, initially in the, the early days of October 7th, of course, it didn't start there. We've, we've had an illegal occupation for decades, too. But the sense that I remember being on, I think it was on LBC and calling for a ceasefire quite on and just almost trying to demonize me for if we cut it back, you know, you might disagree with me or anyone could disagree with me about the genocide. You know, we can have that conversation. But even calling for a ceasefire, the idea that being a voice calling for peace is anything that should be ridiculed or, or held to account in a, in a negative way is absolutely absurd. That's a topsy-turvy world. You can have a legitimate conversation about, you know, is that a realistic thing to call for? And I would argue about what happened with Nelson Mandela, what happened with the Troubles, and ultimately even people who detest each other. Third parties have to come together and bring those people around the table to talk for peace, no matter how difficult it is. But even the act of calling for peace was deemed out of the legitimate, legitimate realms of, of conversation. Okay. I think we see that with public spending. During the general election, I was talking about um, borrowing to invest or money creation and just being absolutely, you know, Victoria Derbyshire on Newsnight, one of the better journalists, tried to ridicule me for it as if it was an absurd position. We now have a Labour government who are also ridiculing for us, but now are taking that exact position just months after winning an election. And that was not discussed at the time of the election because it was out of the narrow bounds. So I think podcasts like this, uh, media that are doing independent work, social media, although social media has its whole own difficulties, as we've seen around Elon Musk and Twitter. I've seen lots of people joining Blue Sky, and I'd really encourage that kind of transitionary movement towards media or social media that is not owned by multi-billionaires who are trying to, to wreck the planet or create division. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I could talk about media for length, but I, I know what you said about the length of the podcast, but it's a nice way for me to end, I suppose, is thanking you for doing this, Alex, because I know that uh it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort to find the guests to think about the questions and and then to upload them but i think these conversations we're having are, are the equivalent not the replacement of old market conversations people would have been having in their in their plaza in their square um which are often missing from public life so i, I think those those aspects are really important well that's very kind thanks i appreciate that just finally zach quick last question is uh you know um what is the the hope for the green party over the next political uh four or five years i suppose reality is you're not going to be the next government so so what does success look like for you in the coming years yeah so at the last election we got 1.9 million votes nearly 2 million and that was a huge jump from where we've ever been before and there was a real sense from the media that we could never win more than one mp and that brighton had just been some kind of fluke so to win four mps is incredibly exciting there's also 40 places around the country, constituencies where the Labour Party came first and the Green Party came second. Um, having said that, uh, the MPs that we just won, uh, North Herefordshire, for instance, we went from fourth place to first place. So it's not just those 40 that are exciting. There's lots of other places, too. I think in terms of what does the future hold, I think there's two things. I think one, it's winning more MPs. I think that's just the obvious thing to be able to hold governments to account. But second, I think it's important to say this. I want to win more MPs, but actually we don't need to wait till the next election. We're already seeing now that the movement of the Green Party growing is already changing the Labour Party's mind. So, for instance, we argued capital gains tax should be raised just very quickly because I know it's a bit policy wonkish or geekish. Capital gains just means that rather than people being taxed just on their income, they're taxed on their assets too. It cannot be right that someone working for a living every single day is taxed more than someone who has a very wealthy asset or an antique that is um, uh, raising them money, but they're not being taxed on it at the same rate. We said those two things should be equal. It's not quite equal, but it has now raised. Um, uh, the position, again, on Israel, the Labour government are not where we need them to be, but they've started to get more critical. And I think that's not just the Green Party, that's a wider peace movement that are slowly pushing the window on that. Not fast enough, people are dying every single day, but that is shifting. And again, on the climate crisis, I'm pleased to see Keir Starmer has gone to COP26, uh, 29, sorry, not ideal COP29 more generally, much a big bigger conversation, but just the fact that he's at least talking about the climate crisis 
is the Green Party, I think, along with uh, campaigners pushing. So we don't just need to win MPs to push that argument. And I think the more that people join the Green Party, hint, hint, uh, not subtle there, but they could join right now. But actually, the more membership we get and the more authority and status we have on the national stage, we can be winning these arguments already and pushing a Labour government to the right positions. Fabulous. Well, Zach, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and listening to your thoughts and and positions. Um, if people enjoy a political discussion, there are uh, well, there's loads on, on my podcast. Uh, do check it out with people from all political parties. Uh, but for now, Zach, uh, sincere thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.